Welcome everyone to the NIAN lecture series. Uh, this initiative is uh, a result of a collaboration between uh, NIAN, the Center for the Study of Non-European Art at the University of Campinas, Unicampi, and the SMFA Tufts. Uh, and we have the support of the Getty Foundation through their Connecting Art Histories program. Um, before we uh, introduce uh, our very distinguished guest this evening. Um, as usual, uh, just uh, one reminder, you can send uh, your comments and questions through the comment session on, on YouTube. Thank you. Claudia, can you please uh, present our guest? Okay, boa noite, good night everyone. It's a pleasure to be here and with my good colleague, uh, yeah. Professor Kelly Morgan. Um, I um, will present her quickly then before she starts. Dr. Kelly Morgan is a curator, educator, and social justice activist who specializes in American art and visual culture. Her, uh, her uh, scholarly commitment to the investigation of anti-Blackness within those fields has demonstrated how traditional art history and museum practice work specifically to uphold white supremacy. Besides her own curator, curatorial experience, she mentors students, emerging curators, and regularly trained staffs at various museums to foster anti-racist racist approaches to collection building, exhibitions, community engagement, and fundraising. Over the past two years, Dr. Morgan has become a leading and influential voice boosting anti-racist work in art museums. Currently, she is a professor of practice and an inaugural director of curatorial studies at Tufts University. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Kelly Morgan. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. It's really wonderful. I'm so excited. It's <laughs> such an honor and a pleasure um, to be with all of you tonight. And I am really thankful and appreciative for the invitation. Um, I know we are for this particular forum, you all really discuss non European art. My talk tonight is going to be a little different, um, and then I'll be discussing non European curatorial strategies. Um, the way I've utilized them, you know, throughout um, my career, particularly in one of the most recent, <clears throat> excuse me, experiences I had during my time as the Associate Curator of American Art at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. So when, I don't know what the conversation is, I'm not totally versed with what the conversation is in Brazil or across South America, right? In terms of the diversity in institutions. But in the States, there's a lot of conversation right now about diversity and equity and inclusion, but nobody really knows, particularly the large, art museums, right? It's like nobody's really defined those terms. <laughs> um, there isn't necessarily, in my experience, I guess I shouldn't say across the board, but there isn't necessarily a direction, right? It's like everybody knows it's something that we should do, but nobody necessarily knows how to do it, right? And they don't, art museums are not actually structured for it, right? The other thing that we have an issue with in the States is we like to say race and racism. We don't like to say white supremacy, right? Um, because that triggers, you know, this idea um, of the Ku Klux Klan and you know racial violence, which is a form, right, of, of white supremacy. Um, but it prevents, I think, an overall understanding, right, of structural racism, systemic racism, right? How um, white supremacy exists in various forms, right? And there's this, there's an array. So then there's someone like me you know, who, who walks into an institution um, as a critical race cultural historian, right? As an anti-racist scholar um, who can kind of explain, right? Or, or, or implement the differences between DEI work, anti-racist work and abolition work. And unbeknownst to me, <laughs> as I started my curatorial career, um, it took me a minute, you know, to realize that institutions can often, or were often, you know, talking the talk, you know, but couldn't walk the walk. So whenever I would come into an institution, next slide, 
I would start with this quote by W.E.B. Du Bois. And it's from his pretty much, I think, the most well-known work, you know, that, that he wrote in 1903 um, called The Souls of Black Folks. <clears throat> and in the States, you know, Du Bois was probably the most prolific Black scholar, you know, of the 20th century. And I'll wait, you know, I know we technical difficulties happen, um, but I want to read the slide to yeah. you. Just a second, because the slide is not moving for us. Yeah, here you go. Okay, there it goes. Thank so, you. So in this piece, in Souls of Black Folk, he's talking about like the way that Black Americans can kind of see America for, for what it really is. Coupled with the fact right, that, that we know and we can see America um, for what it claims itself to be. So he says, between me and the other world, there is an ever unasked question unasked by some through feelings of delicacy, by others through the difficulty of rightly framing it, all nevertheless flutter around it. They approach me in a half hesitant sort of way. I me curiously or compassionately. And then instead of saying directly, how does it feel to be a problem? They say, I know an excellent colored man in my town, or I fought at Mechanicsville, or do not these Southern outrages make your blood boil? At these I smile or am interested or reduce the boiling to a simmer as the occasion may require. But to the real question, how does it feel to be a problem? I answer seldom a word. And this quote is really important to me because throughout my career, the question was always, how did you get here, <laughs> right? What are you doing here? Um, because as, again, you know, an anti-racist curator, my approach was always, I was always approaching the problem from the root, which discomforted tons of people, right? <laughs> you know, all, all, like all the time. And it was fascinating to me that, you know, almost a hundred years later, actually over a hundred years later, this was still a thing, you know, that, you know, for I think 20th century or 21st century questions in that way, you know, it's like when the, the kind of like liberal white American comes up to you and says, I voted for Obama, right? <laughs> right? And I can't tell you how many art parties I've been to where that was like the first thing somebody said because they really didn't know what to say because I was the only black person in the room, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's this discomfort. <clears throat> and what I realized was that my career you know, over the last eight years has been this series, you know, of institutional upheavals from doing this work because the work is so inherently disruptive, right? Because white supremacy is so inherently foundational to art museum structures. Next slide. So when I started at the Indianapolis Museum of Art in New Fields, I did a similar presentation, started with this quote, um, because the institution was at this point of like, you know, literally hiring me to diversify the collection, right? And to diversify our, our curatorial approach across the board um, to exhibitions and programs. We worked in what was called a core team model. Um, so the curator was very purposely decentered. So it was a group effort, you know, whenever we brought exhibitions or programs, you know, to fruition, um, there was representatives from every department, you know, involved in the core team process. There were just a whole, a whole lot of steps, um, but it was a way to kind of um, equalize, right, the exhibition programmatic um, process, you know, so that everybody had a say, right, that everybody could contribute to a show in some kind of way. And so an example I can give you is that, like, you could maybe be a guest services staff member, right, but if you had a great idea that contributed to like a, a, a learning model or module, you know, for um, the end of an exhibition, you could design that module, right? Um, and not necessarily be um, on the education team, you know, or in interpretation or a curator. So it gave most of the staff or the majority of the staff the same kind of stake, you know, in an, in an exhibition. Um, then it, then, most institutions, right, are, are traditionally, 
used to. And it was fabulous. You know, when I got there, I was like, oh, this is great because most institutions, particularly large art museums in the States are very, the departments are very siloed. It's really hard, you know, to work across departments. And part of my curatorial practice was really building, you know, cross-departmental um, coalitions and collectivity, um, which again, you know, I ran into a lot of issues. You, you Usually, you know, in my experience, museum leadership doesn't like, doesn't really like that, you know, type of work. So it was to come to a place where that was what the staff was already doing and there was a structure for it and there was a process and a policy for it. I was like, this is great. However, next slide. Again, there was a lot of conversation about diversity, you know, and diversifying our audiences. And if you know anything about the state of Indiana, <laughs> you know, in, in the, you know, in terms of United States history, um, it is it is actually, you know, the the Ku Klux Klan is actually headquartered in the state of Indiana. Um, it's a really problematic state in terms of gender politics, sexuality politics, racial politics, you name it. Um, and there's a process called redlining that happens all over the states. Um, that is like a, I don't know if I would call it silent per se, you know, but it's it's this it's like a quote unquote like invisible form of segregation, right? In terms of who can buy homes where, right? How um, different neighborhoods are, you know, funded in terms of taxes going to the school systems, all these kind of things. And so this is how ghettos are created, you know, in the United States. So the 38th Newfield sat on the corner of 38th Street and um, what was MLK and Michigan Road. So these are not great pictures, but imagine, you know, so you're like sitting in front of your computer, right? So imagine that you're actually sitting in your car at an intersection, right? So you're sitting at a traffic light. On one side of the street, you know, was Newfield, so where you see the sign and the red truck. On the other side of the street was Crown Hill Funeral Home, right? And there were the, and it was, it literally formed like this gate. <laughs> and 38th Street in Indianapolis was the hard red line, you know, in the city between white and black and between the haves and the have nots. So very little black people live north, or people of color actually live north of 38th Street, right? So much so that the street name changed. So on the south side of 38th Street, right, it's called MLK Boulevard. On the north side of the street, it's called Michigan Row, right? So there's this linguistic geographical markation. So it was really just like, don't pass go, <laughs> you know, don't create, you know, don't collect $200 if you're a Monopoly player. Um, way of telling people of color, telling working class people, right? Telling lower class people to stay out. And so it was this whole idea of like, you know, we're gonna diversify the, the, the museum audience. And I said, well, if you're gonna do that, we first have to deal with where we are in the city. How do we combat, you know, geographical <laughs> racism? You know, the museum actually, that the museum literally like represents. So that ruffled a little bit of feathers. People were just like, oh my God, like, I can't, you know, basically, because it, it's something that people knew in Indianapolis, but people didn't say out loud, right? So I was speaking out of turn in certain cases. And I said, okay, I'm going to be careful about that. I'll see, you know, I'll let, I'll throw that pebble out there and kind of let that ripple. <laughs> Next slide. So, and what I'm kind of walking you all through is what I call my temperature taking, right? I'll take the temperature of an institution. So again, institutions that say, right, they want to do the work. It's like, how prepared, you know, are you for this work to happen? So this is the um, one of the front galleries of the American Wing. Um, you know, I was sort of charged right with the entire American Wing, and so there's this large um, Georgia O'Keeffe, you know, that you see that I think is probably on the right side of your screen, just like it's mm -hmm. on the right side of mine. Um, and I had a collector in Philly who had a piece by Barclay Hendricks um, called Doctor Cool, um, which is the piece that you see way in the back of a black man, like all in white, and Barclay was a dear friend of mine, um, but also a really important, you know, 20th century American artist. And he worked, you know, in uh, figurative realism, but in monochromatic tones. 
So when I left Philadelphia and the 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 collector said, you know, I really want to loan this work, I said, oh, I have a perfect place for it. Right? <laughs> so I'm going to put it in the modernism gallery because the O'Keefe was the center of the gallery. Mm-hmm. It's a major piece um, because it's, it's one of her Jemison and Weed pieces, um, but it's the only one with four blooms. Um, and it's also the one that was commissioned by Elizabeth Arden, like the, the uh, cosmetics magnate, right, for her Fifth Avenue salon. So it's a, it's a um, blockbuster piece, you know, that people come and see. Um, and I said, okay, I'm gonna put this black man, <laughs> you know, in this gallery, right? Um, kind of, I hate to say it, in O'Keefe's shadow, right? But again, to kind of disrupt, you know, the prestige, maybe? Is a good is it's the word to use, you know, of like O'Keefe's presence here. Um, and O'Keefe is one of my favorite American artists, but it was it was really like, how do I kind of slice through the whiteness you know, that is so mm-hmm. present in this gallery? Um, next slide. So these are some installation shots um that like I'll go through. This is a, a piece. Um sorry, this is a uh up close piece, you know, because uh Hendrix worked from photography and he was very much so about the everyday, you know, black person, right? So people he would just kind of meet on the street that he found interesting. Um, His cousins, you know, family members, you know, elevating, you know, these people um, to a, to a space of reverence, you know, that they, as they were, right, as they looked going to work, you know, as they looked going to church, right, <laughs> as they looked in their everyday lives, was worthy of American portraiture at, at, a, at a, um, a large scale, right? So a lot of the paintings, you know, are really, are really large. Dr. Cool is really interesting because this particular figure is actually not a doctor. Um, he was a pastor. And we have, you know, this, this saying in the Black community of like jack leg preachers, you know, or like street corner preachers. Um, and he was one of those, you know, one of those figures. Um, and it's just a really, you know, Im- Im- important piece. And you can actually find the, 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 the photo, like actually still in auction. Next slide. So with that, um, I also, another collector reached out to me and said that they had a Richard Hunt sculpted sculpture. And Richard Hunt, another black male American artist, um, probably if I would say between him and Mel Edwards, you know, is like the, the one of the only living um, abstract, Black sculptors, you know, still alive today, you know, and, and actually still making work. You know, Richard is in his late eighties, you know, early. I'm sorry, mid to late eighties. Um, so then I, so going back to this sort of like magnificence of this gallery, and I was like, oh, I can get a huge pedestal, <laughs> and put this Richard Hunt in there. Um, so I do that. Next slide, and come to this really interesting way that. The hunt is centered in, in like one of the walkways, right? Kind of um, pair, uh, perpendicular to the O'Keefe. But these three in the back, so you see the Barclay Hendricks. There's a little small sculpture on a pedestal back there. That's a Sergeant Johnson, also alone, also a black male sculptor. He was a Harlem Renaissance artist. Next to the painting, um, next to the Barclay Hendrix is this is this painting that you can't really see very well, but that's a Jacob Lawrence, um, and it's also a really famous, um, a really popular, you know, piece with guests because it was an image of like a tie rack, right, and like an old like shoe. You know, do you? I don't know if you guys remember these things, but like in the in the eighties and the seventies, there were these old plastic like shoe racks that you hung on the the back of your closet, um, and it was a it, it's an image of that but he abstracts it. So it was a way, right, that black and again, working class um, Americans could come to abstraction through just a very everyday piece of um, clothing, right? And just like this sort of utilitarian piece in their homes. You know, this was a type of piece that every black family, (laughs) you know, grandparents, aunts, uncles had in their houses. So I was like, okay. Let me see if people kind of get that. And it was a hit. You know, people love Dr. Cool. People were like, oh my God, because the galleries don't change that much in um 
in U.S. art museums, you know, permanent collection galleries pretty much stay the same for years. So they, it was a huge shift and people really noticed. And whenever I would say like, yeah, those pieces are all by black male artists. And they would go, oh my gosh. So I was like, okay, that works. And it's bringing, you know, word travels, right? So Indianapolis is kind of like a, a big, small town. So people were like, there's a new American art curator, you know, at the museum. She has a, there's a space, you know, in the American galleries where, it's, where she has these, you know, these pieces by, you know, black artists on view, um, like all in one space. Because <laughs> the museum, to give the museum credit, there was work by black artists, you know, all around, but it hadn't necessarily been, you wouldn't know, right? Unless you actually knew the artists. Mm -hmm. And these were new pieces, they, even though they weren't new acquisitions, they were loans, right? Um, temporary loans, but it sent a message, you know, that there was a different presence in the gallery. Next slide. So that began, you know, to catch on, you know, I began to actually do talks to introduce people to Richard and Barclay. Um, Richard is the artist on your the left hand side of your screen. Barkley is the artist on the right. Barkley actually passed away. Um, Richard lived in Chicago, so Richard actually came to visit. So it was like you know again just introducing, you know, the Indianapolis community, you know, to this artist that was you know right up the way that they could really you know go and see his work um, and actually hear from him, you know. So I kind of let that marinate, <laughs> you know, within the institution. Um, as well as within the community. Next slide. And then I set my sights on something a little more discomforting. And this is the Rotunda Gallery. You know, right off, it's also a part of the American wing. It was a very like sacred space in the institution. Um, it's really anchored by a Tiffany window, which I'll get in into in a minute. Um, but a lot of prayer happened in this space, right? Yoga. <laughs> as you see, happened in this space every Saturday morning. Um, and it was a very Indiana specific space. Um, so the piece on the far left is a piece by Robert Grohl. Um, that was a 19th century scene of downtown Indianapolis. Um, the piece in the back that you can't really see that well is a, um, a white female sitter. The painter was Ruth Pratt Bobbs, who was one of the most important um, women Indiana artists, you know, working at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and there were two other pieces that are actually like on the, um, from the vantage points that we are sitting in right now that aren't in the picture. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna disrupt this space. Um, primarily, next slide, because I kept thinking, you know, as I kept walking through the space and I would notice, you know, walking through this space with like my Muslim students you know, walking through this space with my Asian students, you know, walking through this space with like, you know, uh, black students, you know, from across the um, Indianapolis public school system. And it was always this kind of like tense or like they would shut down, right? And I was like, okay, there's energy, <laughs> right, going on here. Um, and I started asking, you know, around me, around like, some of the docents, right, just around the institution. And I started saying, has anybody actually done anything about how white the Rotunda Gallery is? You know, and it was silent. So he would just like hear a pin drop. And then eventually, you know, somebody said, well, why would you ask that question? And I said, well, have you ever walked through that gallery with a group of people of color? Have you ever walked through that gallery with people who aren't Christian, did you ever think to yourselves that maybe it's not as it's not as welcoming as you think it is? And no one had ever asked those questions, right? Not let alone actually unpacked them. So for me, it was like, well, how can you know I as a curator or my colleagues as curators like activate permanent collections through methodologies that address those issues, right? That address how the normalization, you know, of whiteness, <laughs> right, of the white body, particularly white femaleness, um, and even Christianity, right, can be a type and can function, right, in 
service to systemic racism, you know, or to white supremacy? How do we unpack that and then subsequently, right, create new ways forward? Next slide. So from there, I decided to what I what I call excavate. So I started to excavate these two pieces. Um, this is the Angel of Resurrection um, by William Comfort Tiffany, you know, who was a major glass designer um, and artist painter. You know, he's if um, he's really well known for again stained glass windows clearly, um, but he made these lamps. You know, stained glass lamps that so you know in so very popular right in stores. William McGregor Paxson. Um, is also a really famous uh, early um, 20th century American painter, but this nude is not his typical style, right? And it was, when I said there were two other paintings on the, from the vantage point, you know, that we're sitting in that you couldn't see in the gallery, this is one of them. And I just found it fascinating because um, Indy definitely had that whole issue, right, about male frontal nudity but not so much right, right with, the, with the white female body um, because it's elevated in a particular way. Next slide. So the idea, you know, like the narrative around the, the Tiffany window and these, in the relationship, right, between these two pieces was that the window, and this is actually true, the window was commissioned by Benjamin Harrison's wife upon his death. Benjamin Harrison was the 23rd president of the United States. Um, he was also a son of Indianapolis, you know, from Indiana, served, you know, in the Union Army during the Civil War, and is really hailed, you know, as, as a hero, right, of Indy. The thing that they don't really tell you, not just the museum, but history in and of itself, about Benjamin Harrison's time in office is that lynching in the, in the Southern United States, actually across the United States was at its highest during his presidency. So I took it upon myself <laughs> to bring that little tidbit of history to light. Because when we think about Tiffany, you know, as a design studio, you know, as a American artist, that's literally like manufacturing, you know, artwork, not just for collectors, but for um, commercial reasons, we are talking about the manufacturing and the industrialization, you know, of the northern cities. What's happening in the southern half of the country that's allowing that industrialization to happen? That something is Jim Crow segregation. The crux of that Jim Crow segregation is the political terror and lynching that is going on and happening to not black, you know, races and brutes, you know, and crazies and sambos and uncle times as, it, as the stereotypes would have you believe. It's happening to black business owners and, back, and black landowners and black teachers, right? And black people who are literally moving up the economic ladder themselves in the best ways that they can, right? The point of Jim Crow segregation was to reinscribe slavery by another name. And that, uh, that other name is Jim Crow. They needed Northern industrialists, needed a new labor force. And you had all of these like, you know, again, quote unquote, dangerous black men <laughs> roam in the South. Um, and so it was very much so a political directive, right? It was a strategy. So Tiffany isn't just making this artwork just willy nilly because he's just such a great artist. He's making this artwork because there's an economic phenomenon that's happening from the South, fueling, <laughs> right, Northern industry that allows him to do it. That is literally circumscri circumscribing and killing, right, Black people. Now the Harrison's, um, benefit, I guess. Um, he did help, you know, uh, many immigrating, you know, Black families who were coming from the South, you know, to Indiana, you know, for better lives at the time. Um, it was something that he didn't publicize, of course, right, but he did help, um, you know, many Black families sort of relocate in, uh, in Indiana. 
and across Indianapolis. Next slide. So in my mind, I was just like, why is this not in the label copy, <laughs> right, anywhere? The other thing that was really interesting about this Tiffany window um, was it is, you know, the archangel um, Michael, you know, at the, um, the resurrection of, of Christ, right? So he has his horn, but he's also in this, in this chain mail suit, like a knight. And in 1903, 1904, there was only one organization that utilized knight iconography. This is the state of Indiana. That, whether art historians, right, previous curators, um, even the even Tiffany Studios, right, wanted to admit that or not, this chainmail night iconography here is a direct visual message to the Ku Klux Klan, right? And the whole idea is like, well, you know, it's actually. Um, I should say the narrative. It's like, oh, it's, it's actually in reference to, to Harrison's, you know, time during the Union Army. He never, uh, Harrison was never in combat, <laughs> right, during his time in the Union Army. So I'm like, yeah, no, that ain't what that is. That's not what that is. But okay, you know, I'll give y'all that. So next slide. Um, so that was one, you know, part of the excavation. The other part and applying a critical race lens is that the Paxson is glazed, which means it has like a sheet of glass right over the top of it. So when you look at it, it really reflects Archangel Michael, you know, literally off this female news body. What was the reasoning for lynching across the US? It was, it was a lie, it was a fictive reason, right? But the reasoning was always this protection of white womanhood, right? This protection of white femininity, you know, this ethereal white femininity that was almost angelic, that was very confining to white women, right? <laughs> right, And very abusive, you know, to white women too. So it's this white racist patriarchal, right? Where uh, male imaginary that's happening. So I'm in the space, you know, and I was like, all of this, you know, is completely acted, you know, here, you know, whether or not the labels say it. Um, if you know the history, you can see, right, the visual cues. And we can't act like, you know, this work is not being, you know, artwork isn't made in a vacuum, right? It's made in the context of the time, right, that the artist is working. Paxton's piece was painted in 1907. Next slide. You know, so with that, as luck would have it, I have a lot of nice collectors, right? <laughs> a collector comes to me again and he says, hey, Kelly, I have this Robert Cole Scott um, moving, losing wall space. You know, can I loan it, long-term loan it? And I said, sure. And I hadn't seen it at first. And I said, what, you know, which, what, which painting is it? And he said, it's the St. Sebastian. And I was like, oh, sweet. You know? <laughs> and he said, where are you gonna put it? And this particular collector, um, from Milwaukee, but had taught at IU for a number of years. So he was familiar, right, with the Rotunda Gallery. So I was like, I'm going to put it in the Rotunda. And he was like, oh, my God. He was like, you are going to, like, I, I, like, I love that you're going to do that. But, oh, my God, that's going to ruffle so many feathers. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> like, that's the point. So comes in. I put it up. Um, Cole Scott's piece is really about miscegenation, right, because um, he's from a mixed race family. Um, the piece is really, you know, using the St. Sebastian iconography to talk about how miscegenation and lynching kills us all, right? So this is why you have a, a figure as St. Sebastian that's half black male, half white woman, but noosed, right? And tied to white men and black and a, a white man and a black woman. Black men were killed, right, for the alleged Rape, rape of white women, where white men raped black women in the South with impunity. You know, and so you do have this large, you know, mixed race um, population. 
um, particularly in the port towns, Mobile, Charleston, New Orleans, right? Um, and Cole Scott, you know, is is from Louisiana. And he's saying, you know, in 1996, you know, this is still an issue. You know, we've never talked about this, you know, as a country. Um, so the heels are on fire, right? Look at all of the bodies, you know, that have been sacrificed because of this problem in not just U.S. history, right, but this problem in American culture. Next slide. So for me, it was a perfect piece, you know, to really do this excavation with this Tiffany window and this Paxson and Benjamin Harrison, you know, to show how this wasn't something that was only unique to the turn of the 20th century, right? This is something that is still a problem. So I kind of borrowed um, the Whitney's title of their, um, when they, when the Whitney bought its new building and it like redid its whole collection, uh, America is hard to see. And I talk about this, you know, in, in the, um, the, the gallery didactic. The other thing that I'm also leaving out is that my colleague, Anna Stein, who was the curator works on paper in helping me with this and, or I should say working with me on this too, discovered that Tiffany actually had a glass factory in Indiana that was staffed purely and solely by child laborers, right? 1906, 1907. So, and they would bring the kids, you know, to the museum, um, you know, at certain times of the year for like breaks. And so we had these tiles, you know, that the kids made. And so she was just like, oh my God, Kelly, you know, <laughs> you know like I just, nobody's ever looked into any of this. And I said, yeah, and this is, this is something you can do in pretty much any of major American art museums permanent collection right? Like you can tell these stories. They just aren't always told because they're not comfortable, right? So um, you can go to the next slide too. So again, I was like, I don't necessarily know how this is going to go, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. And um, in this, the, the public, the Indianapolis community, next slide, these are just installation slides um, or installation views. You know, this was actually a, a local um, news piece about it, like they ate it up. You know, people were really hungry, you know, for this type um, of interpretation. So light bulb goes off for me and I said, we're not giving our publics like enough credit at all. You know, cause it's like, oh, you know, we don't want to make people uncomfortable. People found it fabulous. Leadership at the institution, however, did not. <laughs> so that was something, you know, that was said in senior leadership it's, it's senior leadership meetings that was kind of being funneled back to me because it wasn't something that they could say publicly, right? Because it was increasing membership and it was increasing visitation, right? So people were coming, you know, particularly to see it. Next slide. People were taking note, you know, of what not just I was doing. Um, but what a lot of my, because a lot of my colleagues in other areas, both curatorially as well as other areas in the institution, were doing similar work. Next slide. So we had this sort of critical mass, you know, of workers, museum workers, who were starting to kind of radically transform the institution. And one of my favorite Angela Davis quotes is, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world, and you have to do it all the time. Like, if you really believe the change is possible, you know, you have to do it and act like it every single day. And particularly as, as a Black woman, um, we don't necessarily have a choice, <laughs> right? Because as women of color, we're kind of, we're like on the margins of the margin, you know? And so change is necessary. Like, our whole existence is change, right? Because there is no space for us outside of the space that, the system doesn't make space for us, right? The space is that we exist in are the space that we create for ourselves. Next slide. So exhibition time, right? So I come around, um, I meet Samuel Levi Jones, who was a black Indianapolis artist. Um, and Sam's work, you know, was, was I just, I kind of discovered it at a, um, at a very perfect time in my, in, in my, at my, in my time in Indy, because he does a similar type of excavation where he deconstructs law books and encyclopedias um, and various texts 
you know, to really get at, you know, the roots and the structures of not just systemic racism, but also systemic sexism. Um, so we did a show um, called Left of Center, and this is the title wall. And the the guy in the back, way back here with the glasses, um, was my co-curator, Bryn Jackson, who was also the assistant curator of performance and audience and audience engagement. So Bryn was doing a lot of social practice um, work, a lot of bringing in a lot of social justice centered artists, right? So again, like we had this kind of momentum going. Next slide. So I, um, myself and the exhibition designers, we really wanted to make the gallery because the gallery that it was in, I can't, I don't know the square footage, but it was huge. It was very like, you know, um, voluminous. And I wanted to make it more like, I wanted it to have like a living room feel. So I put like Ebony Magazine, <laughs> you know, and like all of these sort of, you know, very specifically black, um, very specifically black publications. Um, I wanted audiences to know that what, you know, Sam's process was a part of a tradition you know, of recognizing like black humanity, that's something very specific to um, African-American art making. Um, and some of the works, so the piece that you see, like, you know, just kind of directly right in the middle of the, in the middle, middle of the image is a piece called Complex Occupation. And it's named, um, it takes its title from a lyric from one of uh, Erica Badu's really famous songs called Other Side of the Game. <laughs> Right, and I wrote the label copy in black vernacular, right, for that piece and some other pieces, you know, in the show because I wanted black people to kind of to not just see themselves, but to see their, to see the way that we speak, to see the stuff that we read, right, <laughs> to see the stuff that we see in our homes every day, right, in this show. Um, next slide. And so with that, you know, it was a really important moment, you know, for the institution um, because it was a very different, right, kind of exhibition. Um, the other really interesting thing about it was it was the first solo show of a Black Indi Indiana artist that the institution had ever put on. It was also the first show, the first exhibition by the institution's first black curator. Pretty big deal, <laughs> you know, in you would think, right, in an institution that claims it wants to diversify its audience. Um, but the marketing department, you know, said directly to my face, you know, we will not, we refuse actually, we refuse to market the show to black communities. And I was like, okay, no problem. I got something for that, you know. And I didn't actually say that out loud, but you know, that was, you know, my my um, my response in my head. So I marketed the show myself, and I marketed it. I made. Um, I have a one of my colleagues who's a graphic designer made flyers. Um, so me and my students and my friends and <laughs> we just went around the city and we just peppered, you know, barbershops and restaurants and churches and you know, just with with the flyer. Um, any, every, anybody and everybody that I knew, you know, I gave flyers to, um, to just let the community know, you know, that the show was happening to, um, you know, to introduce black communities that weren't familiar, you know, with Sam and his work to his work. Um, he did a bunch of, you know, promotion on his, on his end as well. Um, actually like the, you know, us kind of fighting the institution really strained our friendship, you know, after a while. Um, but we, um, we did black radio, you know, we did all of the black press, we did it all. Um, and it resulted in the largest opening, I'm trying to think of the stat now, but it was like 85% of people who showed up at the opening were people of color. And it was the first time that that many people of color had showed up at an IMA opening in over five years. Right. So in my mind, <laughs> I'm like, this is working. And it was. But this, the senior staff, you know, again, was not happy about it working. Next slide. So this was the acquisition that kind of broke the, the straw that broke the camel's back. So 
coming into the collection, the design collection, my colleague Shelly Salem, who was the, um, or who still is the curator of design, um, acquired this piece by Roberto Lugo. Roberto is a Puerto Rican um, ceramicist, you know, from Philly, um, lives in South Kensington, you know, is, is a really, um, a, you know, really dedicated, you know, to working class Black and, and Latinx people. Um, he makes his work, you know, to represent, not just to represent those people, um, but to also to kind of re- narratorize, right, the meaning of porcelain. He worked, these, this is a porcelain floor lace, and he works in porcelain. Um, you can see the title, right, the explosion of Colin Kaepernick and John Brown. Most people know, you know, Colin Kaepernick and, what's hap and what happened to Colin Kaepernick when he started to protest against, um, or in, in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, you know, during his time as the quarterback of the San Francisco 49ers. I think a lot of people know who John Brown is too. Unfortunately, in Indiana at this particular time, and this is twenty, this is September twenty nineteen, right? So this is the Sam show closes, and we have an we have a, a acquisition meeting, and Shelley brings this up, you know, for acquisition. So I explain, you know, who John Brown is, um, and one of our major donors, who was also a board member, goes on this just ridiculous like racist rant about like how everything you know this this you know this piece is inappropriate because colin kaepernick should have just been a better capitalist right <laughs> right things have gotten so much better for african americans like you know why why do we need to show something like this and um and i responded back you know and i said the reason why we need to show something like this is because roberto is very much so commenting on what we lose when we stand up for black humanity. John Brown lost his life. Colin Kaepernick lost his livelihood. Now we know, you know, he had a Nike contract, like he's straight, you know, <laughs> it was not like, you know, he's missing a whole lot. But the point, you know, was to say that black humanity matters and it needs to be represented in any and every way that we can possibly do so. Um, I, was pretty much attacked full on after that, after speaking up in that meeting, right? Like I had basically spoken out of turn, you know, to one of our important, important donors. Um, you know, I was not supposed to say, <laughs> you know, what I said, despite the fact that I'm actually like a scholar in this, you know, in, in this artwork, right? The artwork also represents like me, <laughs> my history, right, as a Black American, um, and even I think myself, you know, currently, you know, as a Black woman, not just as a curator. And, um, you know, at that point, it was just kind of this all out, you know, um, you know, attack of me and anybody who supported me in the institution. Um, so six months later, no, maybe about nine months later, next slide, I resigned. <laughs> Um, and I resigned very publicly. Um, initially, you know, the first thing I did was I wrote a I wrote an essay called "To Bear Witness: Real Talk About White Supremacy in Art Museums Today," um, where I tell a lot of these stories. Um, and then I did an actual um, interview, you know, with the Indie Star about all of the things. Like I just kind of delineated, you know, all of the things that were like very direct racial discrimination that had not just happened to me, but that had happened to several of my colleagues, including the one um, senior colleague of color. We had one senior leader, you know, of color um, at the institution at the time. And once the director sort of figured out, right, that that person was helping us, you know, get this work done and get this work out of here, he fired him. He didn't actually fire him, he eliminated his position, right? So he like forced him to resign basically, just like he kind of forced me to resign. So I delineated all of that out you know, in this interview, you know, with the Indie Star. And nobody really moved, you know, the first couple of months, like maybe the first five to six months, you know, nobody said anything. The institution just said, oh, she's a disgruntled employee, right? Like I was the angry black woman. And then February, the weekend of Valentine's Day, 2021 rolls around. Next slide. And the institution puts out probably one of the most racist job descriptions you would ever see, <laughs> where it's asking 
for it's 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 looking right they're searching for their new museum director so one the museum director position only exists right because of the firing right the forced resignation of my senior colleague of color secondly they make it very clear to say that this director had to provide direction for the development of new exhibitions outreach efforts and education programs to ensure the best museum practices are employed. That's the wrong, oh, it moved the highlight. Sorry, I'm reading the wrong bullet point. So down one more, Patricia. Okay, so it's Mac, it was, the director was supposed to maximize unique programmatic opportunities, working closely with the curatorial education and public programs divisions to animate the permanent collection galleries in innovative ways that attract a broader, more diverse audience while maintaining the museum's traditional core white audience, right? So that goes viral. Goes viral because the end of the New York Times reporter, Sarah Barr, who broke it, um, also from Indianapolis, had, um, had gone to school, you know, at, at IUPUI. So she was familiar with the problems, you know, at the institution. Um, and because of her, she tweeted, like after she published the article, she tweeted, she said, this is exactly what Dr. Kelly Morgan was talking about six months ago. And from that point, the community outreach, just, or I should say the community network or the, just the community movement was like, he got to go. You know, because I think people thought, I don't necessarily think people thought I was lying, you know, when I resigned, because it's, it is something that's so, um, it's not unique, right? It's something that's very ubiquitous to American art museums um, or art museums in the States. But I think people thought I was exaggerating, you know, and so when this happened and his response to the New York Times was literally, oh, if we knew people were going to be upset about it, we just would have wrote it differently. You know, and so the arrogance right, was unbelievable. Um, and at that point for me, I was like, okay, there's something to, right? The way in which I've kind of worked through this institution, you know, the way that I not just approach like putting the work up, right? And like my temperature taking, but there's like frameworks. And what I'm really doing is utilizing like civil rights, grassroots organizing frameworks. I'm using black 19th century black abolitionist frameworks and it just kind of dawned on me and i said okay this is something you can teach <laughs> you know this is something that you can actually like kind of put together and put a curriculum develop a, a curriculum around kelly um and then i got this wonderful position here at tufts you know to do just that um so in closing and I'll, I'll stop there um and say that always 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 you know stay true to the value systems that you know, right? White supremacy will make you believe, you know, because it's been so normalized that we're supposed to do this and that and every other thing in a particular way. Um, and as people of color, like we have our own value systems, we have our own ontologies and epistemologies and ways of knowing that they know nothing about, that are so successful and that are like so important. And it's that work that we have to do in conjunction with showing work by non-white artists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was wonderful. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, so now we are open uh, for questions. Uh, we can start uh, with uh, one from uh, Sabina Moura. Uh, okay, it's it's a long one because <laughs> the space for comments in YouTube it, it limits the, <laughs> the the size of the comments, so it's, it's broken down. But okay, so uh, hello, Dr. Kelly. Uh, thanks for such a necessary talk. Uh, here in Brazil, we are experiencing uh, a big. I don't know if that's what she said, but it, it's what's written. Probably shift. Yeah. yeah, I think it's actually shit. So, okay, so let's move on a big shit in museums. And she's right. Uh, in terms of diversity politics, uh, I am interested about the concept of uh, white supremacy since it has a huge historical weight 
often associated with far-right politics. However, it has been more and more used in academia as a concept and as an analytical tool, in, uh, including art history. So my question is, if you have been discussing white supremacy as a concept in art history, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I used it in my PhD dissertation and try to retrace the uses of this uh, concept. Yes, yeah, Sabrina, thank you so much. That's a great question, and I have been. Um, it's been this new rabbit hole <laughs> that I have gone down um, because I started, and you may ask, and a lot of you on the on you know here tonight may know this, but it was so, it was news to me. It's like I I discovered that the post colonial scholars, you know, mid twentieth century to now, have been writing about the museum, right, as a like colonial repository. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, you know, like, where has this scholarship been all my life? Um, and primarily Césaire, you know, I was like, I was reading, you know, discourse on colonialism and was like, oh my God, you know, he's he was writing about the museum. And I just kind of kept going. And with that, you know, with that and watching Raoul Peck's um, Exterminate All the Brutes, that and then um, Dan Hicks, The Brutish Museums. Right, which took me through the whole like cultural heritage, you right, conversations. Mm -hmm. And I said, why are we not talking about art history as a discipline was created to maintain white supremacy? Like it is the visual wing, you know, of the colonial project. You know, Winkleman or Winkleman, right? I'm horrible at like my neck. <laughs> Winkleman, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but like father of art history, Sabrina, right? Working in Germany, his whole thing is completely divorcing Greek and Roman um, neoclassicism from its Mediterranean and North, you know, Middle Eastern, North African roots. So he completely erases Egypt, you know, and, and again, you know, Arabic influence, Islamic influence too, completely from Greek classical antiquity. And I was like, nobody thought that was interesting. Like nobody thought that was a problem. <laughs> and as I kept, you know, continue to kind of move through, because like, I totally haven't done the research as much as I as much as I want to, right? Like, but this is like this your question and like this particular issue is literally the basis of the curriculum that I'm building here at Tufts for Curatorial Studies. It's like how to look at the history of the art museum as a cultural repository for colonization. You know, and for the larger colonial project, colonial nations, you know, not literally, right, but like killed all the people and took all the stuff and then built buildings and put it all on display. At some point, you know, we need to talk about that, <laughs> right? You know, at some point we have to talk about how art history develops as a discipline to maintain that. Not to necessarily teach us how to like, you know, draw and paint in great ways. Not that it doesn't do that too, <laughs> right? But it had a broader systemic, and I would also say like crowd controlling type of functionality. You know, which is why our history has is having the problems, right? That is happening as a discipline right now. You know, which is why art art museums are having the issues that they're having right now, right? You know, these diversity initiatives aren't working. You know, hiring the curator of color, or or maybe or maybe you hire two or three. You know, maybe you acquire, you know, several you know works by artists of color. Maybe you have you know repatriated works, but the issues still remain because the institution itself is not even a vestige of colonialism. It is an absolute representation, <laughs> right? It is, it is a living monument, you know, to colonialism right now. And until we actually like really are honest with each other, you know, and ourselves about that, and we start teaching the history in that way, we'll always have these issues. The diversity initiatives will never work, you know, cause just bringing us into mm -hmm. the space. First of all, the spaces are violent and like dangerous for us anyway, you know? And so, yeah, that is like totally like my bag 
you know, that I have been in for the last maybe six to eight months, you know, just reading voraciously as much as I can, you know, about the, 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 uh, the way that the, the, the origins of art history as a discipline in Germany and Austria um, contribute to white, to like the, uh, the structure of white supremacy overall. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you have other questions from the audience. Claudia, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, I would love to <laughs> uh, ask um, a few questions. Thank you so much. Um, you, you mentioned several times like the, the, what you did with like writing and labels. And that really called my attention because you also mentioned that this, you thought that the museum really did not produce labels at all, right? And this touches on, you know, a kind of a discussion of label and curatorship, should the work speak for itself or the relations of work or how important it is to really put like writing and explanations within the curator strategy. So I would really love to, to hear your opinion about that specifically um, in this process of decolonizing or, or you know, like redirecting um, a collection and a, a way of looking at it. Yeah, it's imperative, Claudia, for the work mm -hmm. that I do. You know, I am totally familiar, you know, with that approach, right, where people are just like, you know, just kind of let it be, mm -hmm. or pack it in. But because so much of what, I do as a curator is this type of excavation work. Um, I have to provide the context, mm -hmm. you know. So, for instance, you know, my my colleague Tyler Green and I are working on um, a, a project called the Dark Water Project, where we're trying to do more of this excavation, you know, of, of historic yeah. American art. And we were um, we were talking to a curator at of American art at a, at a particular institution mm -hmm. <laughs> recently about a William Wetmore stories, Cleopatra. And we're like, you know, here is the letter that he writes, right, to Edward Hale about how he's making this, this work um, as a commentary on Black people not being able, not being qualified for American citizenship right, because this is like 19, 1865, right, between 1867, mm -hmm. so post-Civil War, um, and how, I'm sorry, so that's Cleopatra. Then he makes Libyan Sybil, right, mm -hmm. and he tells, he writes another letter, you know, to Harriet Beecher Stowe, telling her that he's making Sybil as this portent or ominous figure speaking to like the inevitable demise right of the african civilization so we find all of this contextual uh the letters themselves but then also these contextual pieces of material culture you know so what story is looking at right while he's actually like making these two sculptures and long story short we get back our proposal from this particular curator and he had literally taken all of that out. Mm. <laughs> right. And, and the excuse was, well, the gallery isn't big enough, you know, to show all of these things. And, and we were just like, yep, nope, you don't get it. So it was a moment for me where I was like, God, into a, you know, to a certain degree, like American cur curators trained in like historic American art, like don't have the faculties to even like see it. Yeah, like, because we're not we're not typically trained, you know, in that way. And I, and so, and so Tyler said, yeah, we're gonna have to do a little bit, but we're gonna have to do a little bit more like reconnaissance, <laughs> you know, or like figure out like, you know, how to like deliver it in a different way. And I said, no, we're gonna have to train. We're gonna have to retrain people. You know, I said, and that's gonna take a minute. Um, but, you know, that we had, right? Like, this is what the label copy, <laughs> you know, should say. Um, this is the stuff that it's your reference. And this is not like, because we're trying to build a community of practice, you know, so this is not just the art museum, you know, this brings in the archive in the area, you know, this brings in the library <laughs> in the area, 
other historical collections, mm -hmm. you know, um, some of that work can always be, you know, we got light issue, you know, right, light issues and stuff like that. So you have to rotate it. So you have to, you really do have to think about workload, but it forces the institution, right, to, to really rethink how it operates, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like that part, like that contextual work needs to be done because we've operated for almost 250 years as if art museums aren't history museums, you know, or like art objects right. don't hold particular histories and they do, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? They always have. Um, and so that's the type, you know, that label copy has to be there. Not so much to be, you know, like, um, like preaching to people, you know, but to really say like, if we're gonna talk about not just like the problems in art museums, but if we're really going to talk about, you know, decolonizing, you know, the way that we show work, we have to start with how, you know, the work participates in colonization in the first place. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you can't just use the work. You know, you have to use the artists. You have to use the people around me. Because, you know, Story is an interesting figure because his father was on the Roger Taney court. So his father was a part of like the, the Plessy versus Ferguson um, ruling, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he knows all this stuff is, is happening, right? He's influenced by these things. So yeah, I, for me, it's like, how do you put that? You know, you can't put that in like a 120 word label. Mm -hmm. But in IMA, what we were, what we were working on were other learning tools, you know, so audio, video. Um, we had also worked on some, um, oh, what is it? Projection mapping, mm -hmm. right? So the way to put that information into like this fun kind of thing where like you, you've seen these things at airports, right? Where like you step on it and then it like yeah. mm -hmm. does something cool. Okay. <laughs> so it was like a projection map, like image, you know, on the floor that visitors could step on and then it would like splay you know, all of these other um, reproductions, you know, of, of material culture and then um, an and audio that would just walk people through it, you know, whether it was my voice or somebody else's, you know, voice narrating it. We also did, we, we looked at some animation as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> um, I, I have a, a question. Uh, I don't know, Kelly, uh, if how familiar you are or, or not, uh, but there, as you know, there, the, this is a movement happening in many museums and even very traditional museums, and and there are uh, more successful and less successful attempts to decolonize a collection, to present the, the collection, uh, or create an exhibition in a way that contextualizes uh, the, the artworks. Mm -hmm. And, and I, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, a little bit, how do, how do you feel? Can you give maybe some examples of uh, attempts that were uh, interesting, attempts that kind of didn't work? Because I have one example in my mind. Um, which is which I found very interesting, and it caused uh, uh, some uh, discomfort, to say the least, in, in the Netherlands, uh, because um, it was an exhibition at the Maurits Huys, uh, uh, which is the, the housing of the collection of uh, an, a colonizer in Brazil. Uh, that he uh, spent some time colonizing the, the northern part of Brazil, and then he came back mm -hmm. to the Netherlands, and his collection uh, is housed in this uh, in this old uh, building that he, he had built him for himself, his house. So it's, and they did an exhibition a couple of years ago, which I found very interesting. Uh, he has a big collection of um, landscape paintings from Franz Post, which is the artist that uh, was in Brazil with him mm -hmm. during his government in Brazil. And they are always very uh, presented in a very neutral way. Mm -hmm. And they um, started uh, this, uh, as far as I know, temporary exhibition. I don't think it's, uh, it's like the regular, the regular display, but I found it interesting that uh, they presented the paintings of uh, the Brazilian landscape mm -hmm. and it showed many times some uh, very 
rough, very small like farmsteads uh, uh, starting <laughs> in Brazil. And next to it, they presented um, receipts that they had just discovered from yeah. uh, slave buying from yeah. Joran Moritz. Yeah. And that and and that was something that in in the Netherlands was not very well known. And these documents were published, and they caused like this big uh, uncomfortable situation. And the museum put the the, the landscapes, the the France post, post landscapes, next to the receipts mm -hmm. uh, from buying. So that I found was a very interesting way uh, to yeah. say a lot. Uh, without using like a huge label and explaining like the a whole book around the, the painting. So, so I was a little bit curious about um, what kind of examples do you think are, are interesting That's or not? <laughs> it's so, again, like, I'm like, I'm super, I'm a super spiritual person. And so I'm just like, you know, God and the universe is like so on point. I swear to God, Patricia, that catalog has been, I've been reading it for the last two weeks. Oh, from, from that exhibition? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have been reading my friend, um, Diva, let me think, I can't think of what Diva's last name is. She works at uh, Zumaya, she works at uh, LACMA. And we had a conversation about this, because like I said, it's been a rabbit hole that I've been down. So I'm just like, does anybody else know about this? <laughs> like, you know, the question you just asked, right? Like, who else is doing this? Um, and she sent me a bunch of stuff and she sent me that catalog. Um, one other thing that I've worked on recently is the Clay Studio in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they were building a whole new building, right? And they went in and same thing, moving from like a very kind of ritzy glitzy place in center city Philadelphia, uh, which is primarily white, into um, South Kensington, Philadelphia, which is primarily Latinx and black. Mm -hmm. So when they discovered you know, they were going to have to move. They started just going to community, you know, like the state, because it was in Clay Studio was a small enough institution, so it was nimble enough. But the director, the director of um, artistic programs, like yeah, they're teaching artists, um, everybody, like they just started going to community orgs, um, meetings, right, at different orgs in South Kensington um, and saying, hey, you know, we just bought this land here. We don't want to come in as like the clay studio and like, you know, belay, bestow all of our, you know, great art, you know, onto this, onto the people of South Kensington. We want to be what you need. So what's happening now, what's working, what doesn't work, what could our resources help with? What mm -hmm. do we need to completely stay out of? This is 2022, five years. They started having those conversations with those communities in 2016. And the building opens in like three weeks. Oh. And we yeah. did, um, I'm the project evaluator on like the opening exhibition. It's called Making Place Matter. So through the idea of place, um, cause the South Kensington, like the the Latinx community is Houston was Ecuadorian and Colombian and um, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Dominican. So we did all of these different, you know, interpretations, <laughs> you know, the exhibition title. Um, there's a large Arabic community, so we produce we produce materials in Arabic. Um, we did the community council thing, but it's a huge council of people, <laughs> huge. Um, and we got together, you know, once every maybe like six to eight weeks, and we would have, and this was all Zoom, because um, it was mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of COVID, um, and we would do art activities together. So, you know, they would send us, you know, they mailed us all, you know, these little wads of clay and we would make cups or bowls or tiles or whatever. And in that time we would share, we would always start the meeting and say, you know, what's somebody's moment of joy? So we would share our moments of joy. You know, we talk about our pets, you know, we would, we would meet people's families, you know, and it built this bond, you know, where the community now feels like the institution is theirs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that stake. So the other two things that worked really well, you know, for what you're talking about, is that community council members, like if they wanted to, everybody didn't show up. But we did. We worked with the um, social justice leaning 
or committed is a better word, uh, <laughs> design studio. So community members design all of the gallery furniture. Oh. Yeah. You know, so it was yeah. like designed and actually made, right? So like the, the company's called Tiny WPA, so they fabricated it. And then everybody came together and then they actually like built, you know, like they built the benches, you know, and they mm -hmm. built the pedestals. Um, and then we did a label writing exercise at the end, like mid-February, you know, so we went through um, a series of exercises that we used to use in new fields um, where the community wrote the labels for the artworks wow. in the gallery. So there's like, so very little curatorial scaff like i've always called it curatorial scaffolding <laughs> right but like not a not, not like a full-on you know curatorial voice so it's not like here's the curator's label and here's the community's label like, it's one label mm -hmm. you're like written from everybody so that was a way that like the the uh, an institution kind of literally recreated itself you know, putting, literally putting the community, you know, at the center. So it's really, and it's really great when I talk to some of the folks and they're just like, it's so cool. Cause it's like, you know, this like my neighbor, you know, <laughs> and like, you know, go into the gallery and not just see myself, but like see something that I did and I'm not an artist, you know, <laughs> you know so it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, they were small enough, you know, to do that. Like we can, we would be hell with freeze over before the Met could do something like that, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Um, but no, but the the um, the Morty's uh, catalog has been like you know I, it's like so highlighted you know up because I'm think I think I'm gonna teach it in the fall. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, I think I have to choose because Camila here send like two questions, so let's choose uh -huh. one, <laughs> so we don't uh, go too much over time. Um, so she says, hello, Dr. Kelly Morgan, it was a pleasure to, pleasure to hear you. I believe that the discussion in the United States is at a different point compared to Brazil. The effort of some institutions are still limited to offering a day uh, for diversity in museums in, uh, and art institutions. How do you see efforts to write on art history that goes beyond what is traditionally seen in, in art history and museology? So let's stick with that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, one. Uh, for, and like you said, Camila, in the, in the States that's happening. You know, there, um, and, and particularly in Latinx, Latin American, pre-Columbian, you know, um, pre-Columbian art. You know, there's a, I think there's much more of it happening in those areas um, in art history, you know, than European art, you know, or American art. Um, and, it, and, you know, in contemporary, you know, it is, it's, it's being, I think, unfairly placed you know, on contemporary artists of color, you know, where institutions are like, here is all of our colonial issues, Titus Kafar, you know, come in and like do a, you know, it's the Fred Wilson, um, you know, mine in the museum, right? I call it like the Fred, well, I hate to call it a curse, but it's like, it's, it's, it's like a, it's a hamster wheel. You know, it's like Fred did that, you know, project. It was phenomenal. He did it at so many different places, but it never actually like shifted curatorial approach, right? It never actually shifted the writing of our history. Mm -hmm. It wound up becoming this thing that, or this method, you know, that institutions use when it kind of found itself in trouble, right? With its own institutional history. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and I think it's become like almost epidemic you know, and um, so it still has a ways to go, <laughs> you know, in terms of art history, you know, in, in the States. Um, but I think, you know, my Latinx colleagues, you know, and my Native American colleagues are, are, you know, definitely getting pieces out, you know, that are writing against it, you know, in a way that like in my world of historical American art, like doesn't really exist, to be honest, it really doesn't. Um, it's just not there. And there are people who have tried to put like there's because there's a gatekeeping kind of thing that happens in American art where the, the senior people are in positions for like 30, 40 years. 
and that's on the journals, you know, in the mu in in the museums. Um, so in I would say the reason like the last two to three years, myself included, um, there's been many of us who've been trying to publish but can't get our work out. You know, because like I was I actually had a reviewer tell me that I couldn't write about a particular American artist in the way that I was writing about them because I was writing against the traditional art historical narrative. And it was like, you can't write this like this. You know, take this part out and we'll publish it. <laughs> so like I was saying about the curator earlier, where it was like, just completely took everything, you know, all the contextual work, you know, the Claudia's question earlier, like they just take it out. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, so that's something that Darkwater is trying to address, you know, is to create some publication opportunities, you know, for those of us who actually do want to want to do this work. Cause I think, like I said, it, it's harder, um, for those of us that are outside, you know, of Latin American and in and Latinx and Native American and pre-Columbian. I see. Okay, thank you so much, <laughs> Kelly, for your great talk. It was really interesting, and uh, we are now concluding <laughs> this Nian lecture. Uh, stay tuned for um, our advertisements for our next events. And I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Patricia. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Thank you, everyone.